Good morning and welcome to Jew in the City Speaks with your host, Allison Josephs, also known as Jew in the City. We have been facing, well, really as a people, we've been facing anti-Semitism for thousands of years. I would say um, anti-Semitism as sort of a, a U.S. problem is feeling more acute than ever um, for the Orthodox community, especially. I think that we have been noticing attacks, you know, in places like Brooklyn, attacks on yeshivas and kosher stores. Um, where it's feeling like, I don't know, in an age of more um, inclusion, in an age of celebration of diversity, and an age where lots of good things are happening, um, attacks on Jews seem to be going up. And it's certainly been on my mind a lot uh, from a spiritual perspective. Um, being a person now who dresses identifiably Jewish, has two children, who in the last six months have been called out on the street for being a kike and a Jew, sort of knowing that my kids wear identifiable clothing. Um, it's, it's on my mind a lot, as I'm sure it's on your mind a lot as well. And so um, we're so thrilled to have with us today someone who probably does not need an introduction, but she's written um, several wonderful books and her newest one is called People Love Dead Jews, Dara Horn. And just for a quick bio, um, she's the author of six award-winning novels. Um, one of uh, Granta's best young American novelists. She's taught Jewish literature at Harvard, Sarah Lawrence College, Yeshiva University, lives in New Jersey with her husband and four children. Dara, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. So, um, People Love Dead Jews, it is a catchy title. Um, when uh, my husband bought it a couple of months ago, my son saw it and he's like, what's that book about? He tends to be dramatic anyway. So what, um, besides the fact that I think, well, I guess for me, you know, thinking about how we package things that get people's attention, I think we're sort of in a time now where we want people to pay attention to this. So how did you, you know, how and why did you decide to write this book and why did you call it this? Um, well, you know, it's funny. Yes, the title is provocative. Um, I actually, I also have a podcast, which is a spinoff of the book, Different Stories, that's called Adventures with Dead Jews. And for okay. that, um, the production team and I are always joking about, <clears throat> are always joking about how we want to make merchandise, like tote bags, coffee mugs, right? Like no one's taking your seat at the pool with your Adventures with Dead Jews beach towel. Um, so, you know, so yeah, being, you know, provocative, not just provocative, but making you uncomfortable was mm -hmm. my intention. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that we as Jews put a lot in a non-Jewish society, put a lot of energy into making other people feel comfortable. And mm. my point of in, in calling the book, this was to sort of uh, signal that, that that's not what's gonna be happening here. Um, I got the idea for this book um, in 2018. Uh, I first started thinking about this when uh, Smithsonian Magazine contacted me uh, and asked me to write an essay for them about Anne Frank. And I will tell you, uh, I got that request and I felt this enormous amount of dread because I thought, you know, wow, I really don't want to write an essay about Anne Frank. And, you know, the normal thing to do would be to turn this assignment down, but, you know, I'm a writer, so I'm not like doing normal things. And so I just thought, you know, well, this is interesting. Um, why don't I want to do this? And, you know, I talked before about just now about being, you know, making people feel uncomfortable. And I thought what I've known, what I've noticed in 20 years of being a writer is that the uncomfortable moments are where the story is. Hmm. So I thought, why do I feel uncomfortable about this? And then I remembered a news story that I had seen about something that had happened in the Anne Frank Museum in Amsterdam, which for this audience, I do not have to spend five minutes explaining what that is. Um, and the news item was about a young man who, a uh, young Jewish man who was working at the museum and they would not allow him to wear his yarmulke to work. They made that. him hide it under a baseball hat. And, you know, they, and then, you know, he, he appealed this to the board of the museum. They deliberated for four months, finally <laughs> relented, let him wear his yarmulke to work. And, you know, I had read this news story and I just thought, you know, four months is a really long time for the Anne Frank Museum to ponder whether or not it was a good idea to force a Jew into hiding. I love that line from your book. Yeah. Well, I mean, because it was just so, uh, so glaring and so absurd, right? And what you realize is that um, you know, the sort of the two sort of the two major sort of messages or themes that I'm really deep diving into in this book are the first is that people tell stories about dead Jews that make them feel better about themselves. Mm -hmm. And the other is that living Jews have to erase themselves in order to gain public respect. And 
I have to tell you that I've been avoiding this subject for 20 years. Hmm. Um, I, you know, as you mentioned, I've published five other novels, five other books, this is a nonfiction book, five other books before this. All my books are really deeply involved in Jewish history, Jewish traditions, texts. Um, you know, I have a doctorate in Yiddish and Hebrew literature. Um, you know, I spent my whole career sort of like really wanting to write about Jewish culture and, and teach about Jewish culture from this autonomous point of view, where it was all about from within this tradition. And, you know, it's only with this last book that I sort of realized, like, this is something uncomfortable that's worth exploring. Hmm. And so that's when I sort of dove into this project. I like leaned directly into this thing I've been avoiding for 20 years. And I mean, I traveled around the world, sort of, you know, looked through history, looked through different, different kinds of cultural interactions and really sort of unpacked this problem for my readers. So I was noticing this problem over the summer as the, uh, you know, escalation in Gaza started that. Um, so, I mean, for years, you know, our organization exists to kind of deal with people's biases against um, the Orthodox community and ways that we're vilified. And I think in some ways, the thing about being so outwardly Jewish is that like, it's not being erased. It's not being put under, you know, the table. It's in your face. I think that makes fellow Jews uncomfortable if they're trying to maybe do that dance of blending. And I sort of saw all these Jews that wanted to speak out about Israel and say that Israel has a right to defend herself and they didn't feel comfortable to do that. Um, and they marched with everyone else and stood for everyone else's, you know, um, equality and, and safety. Um, and I thought really that there's really, if you are not that into your land and you're not that into your heritage, then you can be a passable Jew. And kind of like the, the larger, you know, Gentile world will accept you. But if you take your land or your heritage and religion too seriously, those are the Jews that we can't really have around. And I think you're saying something very similar, um, you know, with this too, because the second part of the, the museum is not just making this, uh, this worker hide his yarmulke, they also hid Israel in the museum. Yes, right. So that's uh, like when I read this news story, um, you know, then when I, when I had this request from Smithsonian, I remember the news story and then I went, looked it up online because, you know, I was like, did I dream this? Because it seems like, you know, it's so absurd. And yes, as you say, there was a, big, a very similar story that had happened like a few months before that in 2017, where it was the audio guide display in this museum where they have, you know, I don't know, 15 languages and it's like English, British flag, Francais, French flag, until you get to Hebrew. Yeah, Hebrew, no flag. It's like, it's not subtle, right? Not and, subtle. you know, it's this erasure of Jewish experience. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know if we want to go to this at this point, but, um, you know, in the book, I talk about sort of two forms of anti-Semitism that have sort of existed through Jewish history. And I named them after Purim and Hanukkah. And again, I'm loving that I don't have to spend five minutes, you know, like I do on NPR, like explaining what Purim and Hanukkah are, thank you. Um, so, you know, and what I see as the distinction is that Purim anti-Semitism is like, it's, you know, it's like really clear, there's no ambiguity, big bad guys are like, let's kill all the Jews. But Hanukkah anti-Semitism, like they never, it's, they're never like kill all the Jews, right? It's this sort of soft persuasion, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Where it starts as like this, you know, sort of like, here's why our culture is cooler, right? And it's mm -hmm. like, you know, if you want to be cool, you have to do this. Um, and then it only later becomes a coercive thing. And that's sort of, you know, the, that is a much, you know, and I think that in the United States, like we're sort of used to thinking of the Purim kind of anti-Semitism, because that's sort of closer to us in history in terms of the Shoah or, you know, people who came here um, to this country through the mass migration from Eastern Europe who were fleeing from pogroms in the Russian empire. Um, you know, those are sort of more of those types of anti-Semitism. So that sort of feels more familiar mm -hmm. to many Ashkenazi Jews, but this other form is much more common through Jewish history, mm -hmm. right? And you see it in contexts like I talked in the book about the Spanish Inquisition, talk about um, the Soviet Union, but I think, and you brought up this you know, idea of defending Israel in, in public in a non-Jewish society. This comes up so explicitly in Soviet history because, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, you know, um, with the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, the Bolshevik regime creates um, Jewish sections of the Communist Party whose goal is to like, you know, spread Marxism among the Jewish masses. Their slogan, this is before the founding of the State of Israel, this is like in the 1920s, their slogan is, we are not anti-Semitic, we're just anti-Zionist. Anti Whoa. Yeah, oh. 1920. And, you know, and then it's not a coincidence because then, you know, the Soviet Union, like, spreads this message through their client states in the developing world, hmm. right? And so this is sort of becomes like, you know, and of course, you know, 
in order to like, we're not anti-Semitic, we're just anti-Zionist. By the way, we're also anti-religious because that's part of communism. So it's like, you know, we love Jews as long as you're not, you know, I don't know, practicing Judaism, and supporting Zionism, yeah. studying Hebrew. I mean, it's like this editing process of like how you're allowed to be Jewish, which kind of, you know, in this case, eventually leaves you with basically nothing. Um, and of course, in the process of you know, in the process of not being anti-Semitic, but merely being anti-Zionist, they managed to, you know, persecute, imprison, torture, and murder thousands of Jews. Hmm. I mean, it's no wonder that, I guess, for so long, and sort of thinking about the, I guess, like, uh, space of, like, diversity right now, Jews as being, you know, passing the idea of, like, trying to erase that, you know, those different things, parts of ourselves that make us stand out so we can finally get ahead, but I think at the end of the day, like they always come for us, even if we sort of go through the motions of what, you know, the different non-Jewish societies, uh, you know, want us to do, it eventually catches up with us, uh, religious or secular. Um, so I don't, well, I don't know that they yeah. eventually, I mean, I don't know that they eventually catch up with you, but that may, may, may or may not be true in different settings. Oh, so I, like, I, like, I, like his, uh, with Germany, right. I'm saying with, with Nazis, you could, you know, only have one Jewish grandparent and, you know, still it was Jewish enough for, for Hitler. I'm saying there, there are examples like that. No, where people have sort of lost their, you know, uh, cultural or religious connection and still, but maybe, maybe, uh, you know, the Holocaust was a unique, uh, you know, well, I, was gonna say, I think it doesn't require coercion is my point. Mm -hmm. In other words, mm -hmm. like it's sometimes it's that this self erasure sort of becomes, you know, it takes care of itself. Right. I mean, this uh -huh. is sort of, I mean, you know, I have readers who will contact me and be like, you know, I have one Jewish great, 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 great grandparent. Hmm. And I'm like, first of all, that, you know, by the way, it doesn't make you Jewish, right? Unless right. that happens to be your, you know, only all women all the way down. I'm like, right. then maybe halakhically you're Jewish, but you're still right. that, whatever. But like, yeah, you know, there are people who have Jewish ancestry, but who are not right. Jewish. And it's not because of like, you know, the Inquisition, right? I mean, it's right. because of choices that were made by their ancestors. Sure. But, you know, what I think is interesting is sort of this question of self erasure. When we talk about, you know, is it coercive? Is it a choice? Um, you know, I have a chapter in the book about um, this, what I call the legend of Ellis Island, mm -hmm. which is about this like mythology that many American Jews have heard in their family that like their family's name was changed at Ellis Island from, you know, something that sounded super Jewish to something that sounds super not. And it was like right. all because of, you know, this bumbling clerk at Ellis Island. It's a mythology. It never happened. No mm -hmm. one at Ellis Island even wrote down people's names. Um, they were using ships manifests. And then also we have court records from tens of thousands of cases in New York City civil court of American Jews going to court and changing their own names voluntarily. Hmm. Um, but what's interesting to me about that is like, you know, I think that we tend to look at those people as like, oh, those are self-hating Jews. They're running away from the community. That's actually not the case. Um, you know, this, um, there's, it's, this is not my research. This woman, Kirsten from Meglick, who wrote this book, uh, another great title, a book called A Rosenberg by Any Other Name, um, where that. she researches these, uh, these name changes. Um, and she points out like a lot of these people, you know, the vast majority of these people who changed their names, like they stayed in the Jewish community. Like they mm -hmm. like then went back to their shul and said, you know, oh, can you send me my dues, you know, my, my dues statement under this new name, right? But the reason they changed their names is like, they're staring down a reality they couldn't ignore, which was American anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the reality that we are burying with the sort of like happy story about the Ellis Island Cork, right? So, mm -hmm. and you know, today we talk about, you know, anti-Semitic incidents, but like, you know, in 1940, it wasn't about incidents, right? It was about people who, you know, job. Right. Right. I mean, so that's like a really different, you know, set of constraints. And so, you know, I used to sort of look down on that kind of, you know, and sort of like, I, I used to have like a kind of contempt for people who would sort of like were shying away from these things or from people who are making those kinds of choices, which we can see as self erasure. I now have a little bit more compassion because I sort of think mm -hmm. about, you know, some people are facing kind of pressures that are sort of hard for hard for everybody else to imagine. Interesting. I want to jump into Shylock right now. I know we're going a little later in the book, but, um, you know, we've been very concerned about the um, sort of the depiction, the representation of Orthodox Jews in fictional media, in news media. Um, we also are concerned about Orthodox Jews not living up to all of Jewish values. That's a concern to us too. I think you can kind of hold both things simultaneously, but what you wrote here um, struck me so deeply. Only in this play, it's not about killing people. It's about making Jews into a mean cartoon of a bad guy. It occurred to me as I gripped the steering wheel that these two things were in fact, not at all separate, that the cartoon brand of hatred was actually the prerequisite for the killing brand of hatred, killing people brand of hatred. So um, 
Shylock as a cartoon that your son helped you realize uh, the humanity of Shylock was maybe not that human at all. And it really was an awful depiction of Jews. Um, how, can you kind of take that sort of framework of Shylock and talk about, I don't know if, I know you will we'll talk in the last chapter. I'm also very interested in sort of the, I think your uh, realizations around the attacks on the Hasidic community, uh, especially, but have you sort of noticed any media, fictional media coverage, news media coverage of sort of the constant vilification of kind of the most outward looking Jew sort of, and then, you know, w with this idea of when we again and again report on the bad, um, it opens up the door for, for violence or hatred. Well, so I think that there's, um, you know, so the chapter you're talking about is, uh, you know, just for context, uh, it's about, you know, the, for reasons that are not worth explaining, I was sort of, you know, badgered into listening um, to a, um, to a, a you know, a, a um, audio version of The Merchant of Venice in the car with my 10 year old son. Um, like I as, said, as, as one does, point. right? Yeah, as one does. Yeah, not, I'm not going to spend the time to explain why that happened. Um, but what was interesting to me about it was how I had absorbed the apologetics around that play, right? In reading it in school or in university settings where, you know, there's this elaborate of all apologetics around that play where it's like, oh, it's not anti-Semitic, it's just a product of its time. And, you know, like, oh, look, he, you know, Shakespeare really, you know, goes to these lengths to make this, you know, person into a fully human figure. And like, it was my, it took my 10 year old son, like, listening to like Shylock's soliloquy and being like, mom, this is the evil supervillain monologue. Right, right. Every evil, you know, every evil supervillain does this thing where they're like, I'm just like you, you know, if you right. were me, you'd do the same thing. Now I'm going to go kill Batman, right? He's like, you're not supposed to fall for the evil supervillain monologue, right? So, right, right. you know, and it was sort of like understanding like how much I had internalized mm -hmm. and absorbed this idea. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's this kind of you know, and, and so, as you said, this, the cartoon brand of hatred mm -hmm. is like, you know, very common, right? And mm -hmm. it's like, we tend to overlook it, like, you know, it's like, you know, because we're thinking like, oh, this is, you know, it's no big deal, like, mm -hmm. you know, being trolled on social media. It's like, oh, right. that's no big deal. Like, yep. everybody gets trolled on social media. Mm -hmm. It's like, but the, tr the thing that I'm realizing is that like, it's like that kind of you know, the, let's say trolling on social media or those kinds of like, um, you know, belittling and dehumanizing things are what make, that's the prerequisite for more violent um, hatred um, or more serious, you know, more serious social exclusion. Um, so that's sort of, um, that's that's kind of where, you know, where I went with that. And that was a, sort of a realization is that you really can't separate those two things, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. You can't separate this kind of stereotyping, and these negative portrayals from the reality of how people are looking at an entire community. And that that's and that that's intentional. That that's by design. So I think this is what we see, you know, sort of tracking my perception of the Orthodox community, not knowing them personally, growing up conservative, and really holding a lot of hatred in my heart for these weirdos, backwards extremists. Getting to meet Orthodox Jews and being like, hey, these people are pretty decent. They're not, I guess, sort of the cartoon freakish stereotype that I imagine them to be. And then wondering, like, sort of when will media catch up to that? I mean, we're sort of actively working on getting in the writer's room right now, we've discovered in the last few months that every other minority has a Hollywood bureau where they're working with the development and production team to tell a more nuanced and you know complex story. Whereas the Orthodox stories we see either always have you know, someone running away from being Orthodox because it's the most awful thing or you know, some horrible thing that an Orthodox Jew did. Um, and so you know, we see the ramifications of sort of continuous negative depictions and then opening up the door for violence. And, you know, maybe it's a mitzvah if I smash a brick into someone's face, if they're such awful lowlifes. Um, that's kind of, you know, sort of the position that we're in right now. And I mentioned at the beginning, um, you know, one daughter was called a kike um, in uh, Northern New Jersey. The other one during Sukkot, we were visiting friends in Lakewood, New Jersey, and someone screamed Jew out the window. And it's just like, um, it's scary. It's scary to be, you know, kind of both constantly negatively depicted um, because like I've never seen um, someone that looks like a visible Jew on TV, like as a hero or like in a movie as a hero, like maybe there could be, you know, like we said, like a more secular version that could be heroic, maybe such a profile could be done. But um, I, I think that, you know, we don't always have to be um, the villains or, you know, the people to escape from. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, I, I, the other thing that sort of was clear to me is, um, you know, and this came to me as the writer of this book, because, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of the book, like, 
Um, I was originally like the New York Times' go-to person for like their emerging literary genre of synagogue shooting op-eds, right? Like this was like, you know, with like the Pittsburgh attack and then like the one in uh, San, San Diego. But it's like when there was this like series of attacks on the Hasidic community, like this is just before the pandemic, like they're not calling me to do an op-ed, right? And this is really interesting because then you read the um, you know, I read all of the news coverage of like all of these, like, you know, the, the, of the city, the Jersey city shooting at the grocery store in the Sotmer community. And then there was like this, uh, attack in Muncie. This is again, at the end of 2019, um, yeah. where you know, it was like a machete attack at a Hanukkah party. It was astonishing to me is like the way, um, those attacks were reported in the media. You couldn't find an, an article that, that depicted those attacks without, that didn't say something derogatory about the community being attacked. And what I realized is that that was, it's sending a signal to the public, right? It's saying that these people deserve it. That's the intention of that, right? Because you don't find that kind of coverage of other hate crimes. And I thought that was really, really revealing. Um, and so that's, and I realized also that even sort of the way that Jews are, are sort of have taught themselves to talk about anti-Semitism in America is part of that, self erasure like if you think about what we say to like you know in a non jewish context where we're like oh jews are like the canary in the coal mine right when jews are attacked it means that there's this a decline of the society it's like well think about how you're erasing your own you know dignity to see that. right because what you're saying is like you know oh you should care when jews are murdered or maimed because it's an ominous sign that real people might later get attacked right, right. like why like you should not be erasing yourself so you know, this is something, and the other piece of this though, that, you know, um, maybe is, you know, not as obvious, but it's very obvious to me is like, you know, people who are attacking, you know, let's say the Haredi community, like they're not doing this because they like, you know, disagree with Haredi practices and beliefs, right? <laughs> they're doing it because these people are visible. Like that is the only exactly. reason, right? Like they're not like, you know, parsing like, well, you know, I'm really not into Satmar. Right. Like, <laughs> like that's not, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. you know, that's like that, you know, and that's sort of, you know, I think that that's like, that piece I think has become really clear to a much broader, much broader piece of the American Jewish community in mm -hmm. a way it maybe wasn't in the past. And so mm -hmm. that I do think is changing a lot. Um, you know, and I think that there is sort of, you know, and, and I think also a lot of the, um, you know, the attacks that are sort of ostensibly about Israel are also sort of making that really clear, right? Because, and what it's showing is that like, you know, there's a way you, I mean, if you were, if you have to erase yourself in order to be part of the society, like that is a failure of diversity, as you say. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I've done in a lot of my work since this book came out is like, you know, participate, you know, I do a lot of media interviews and I've, you know, I've done interviews on like, you know, many different, you know, for many different audiences um, far beyond the Jewish community. And this is what I talk about is like, you know, this is the test of diversity in this country. You know, does diversity mean we have a bunch of people from all different backgrounds who all think the same way? Yeah. Or are we willing, or, and also like, is diversity that, oh, we don't want to like, you know, don't hate those people because they're just like you and me, they're just like everyone else. Because Jews spent 3000 years not being like everyone else, Yeah. right? That's like, you know, that's the whole purpose of Judaism in a lot of ways, right? Is not to conform to the surrounding society. So if that's the test of like, oh, if, if in order to not be hated, you have to be exactly like everyone else, that is a failure of the concept of diversity. 100%. And that is something that I think that we have a way of, you know, from the Jewish community, we can, that's actually a really valuable message that we can spread with a broader American community about what it means to actually honor difference. I love it. Um, what I love, and I wanted to spend the last few minutes of our interview just sort of talking about your response, because I mean, I would read your entire last chapter out loud if I could, but we don't have time for that. And we want you to sell this book to people who will read it themselves. Um, but um, I feel like your first response is, it's, I remember the position that I don't, can't say where you were in your position. I remember very much seeing like when I was conservative, like the Orthodox, the Hasidim as like us and them. And I think your response of really sort of um, feeling um, that these are your people and kind of those externalities or differences of practice don't matter, like a Jew is a Jew. So I just find it so heartwarming that, um, you know, you really take it personally the way that it doesn't matter if you don't agree with all the ways a Hasidic, you know, person practices that, you know, uh, their you know, deaths and violence being uh, just sort of explained away um, is deeply personal and deep, 
deeply hateful. And I'm just thinking sort of going back to the Purim story, like Haman's sort of like complaint against the Jew Jews is that we are scattered and we're dispersed and we're this non-unified people. And I think responding with Jewish unity as an answer is an incredible response. So I want to commend you for that just as the first thing, um, not just in your own you know way of behaving, but then putting it out there as a model for your readers. Um, the second thing is that your second response to this is that you decide you don't want to go to this um, no fear, no hate march. Um, you know, it's just sort of another march. The Hasidic Jews aren't even there. Kind of what's the point of it? There's something else that catches your attention instead in the wake of this really growing violence against visible Jews. Um, but another mass Jewish gathering near my home a few days earlier also caught my attention. One whose attendance, 90,000 people at MetLife Stadium in New Jersey's Meadowlands, dwarfed that of the March of New York. And unlike the march, it was attended by many of the people who have been directly targeted during those horrific weeks. And this event, which was mirrored in parallel events all around the world, was the Siyam Ashas, the conclusion of the Talmud, a ceremony celebrating the completion of a community studying the Babylonian Talmud called Daf Yomi, or a page a day. Um, and then I'll just skip ahead. It inspires you to begin Talmud study, um, which I love. Um, and I guess if you could give us, um, you know, sort of a little bit of a, uh, you know, understanding of kind of what, what that experience of, of doing Daf Yomi has been like for you. Sure. So, um, I mean, I, had, I, this is like not my first encounter with, with Talmud study. Yeah. Um, but pre prior to this, I'd always found it like very irritating, um, you know, because it's like, you know, it's, a, it, you know, I'm, I'm a writer and like, you know, I write these like artistically constructed texts that are like, you know, a story that brings you to a conclusion. And like, you know, obviously like the Talmud is not about that. Um, and, you know, so, but what I found in sort of embracing this and, you know, I am still doing this We're you know, on, on my staff at Megillah. My daughter's um, also doing yeah, Daphne, by yeah, the way. So, yeah. yes. Um, so, you know, in, in embracing this, what I found is like it felt familiar because I'm, you know, studying the what I what I used to find irritating, which was sort of this like tendency among, um, you know, the among the rabbis in the Talmud to sort of like, you know, constantly go over every possible particular detail and every possible outcome and every possible situation. Like it used to be irritating to me, but now I see it, I understand it as a product of anxiety and grief. Hmm. Right of people who are building a you know a sort of like rebuilding rebuilding a civilization after the Horban, mm. and you know and that project of rebuilding a civ of of creative resilience, um that requires this kind of hyper vigilance right I mean and that is the same hyper vigilance where like you know once you have a certain number of children you're like constantly being like every time you leave your house you're like do I have this 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 and this right like because and the reason you do that is because like there was the one time you left you know whatever it was at home that you needed so it's like you know they're like you know here, what can we do to sort of maintain this you know to maintain this covenant with God right like in this in the wake of this calamity and you know what I think is amazing is the story of um, Yochanan ben Zakkai you know, being smuggled out of the siege city of Jerusalem in a coffin, you know, and then, you know, creating this, um, you know, academy at Yavna. What I think is amazing about that story is how, and, and how it really is the foundation of Judaism as we know it today, what he built is that both Judaism, like both Yochanan ben Zakkai and Judaism faked their own deaths mm -hmm. in order to survive this cataclysm, mm -hmm. right? And then to able to sort of like rebuild after this destruction is kind of like, you know, it's, it's like a tichiyas uh, hamitzim, right? It's like, it's mm. kind of an amazing sort of moment of like, that it's possible to, to, to go past these kinds of calamities and to rebuild in a creative way. And I think that, you know, I find that very inspiring for, you know, as a Jew living in uncertain times. In uncertain times. And um, I think, um, you know, what you also mention in uh, the midst of this, that, um, you start, you're learning about the Shema in, uh, you know, Daf Yomi, and then you start saying Shema at night um, is another, you know, sort of beautiful uh, response to this. I just, we're running out of time here now, but I just want to, you know, sort of close with your final words here, our interview. I still follow today's old, old news, but I also now turn away from it towards the old, the ancient. I'm forever haunted as all living people always are. Our minds are the dwelling places for the fears and hopes of those who come before us. I turn the page in return, carried by fellow readers, living and dead, all turning the pages with me. Um, it's really, uh, it's profound. It's beautiful. Um, I'm, you know, really uh, so touched. Um, and, you know, thank you so much for this book and for, uh, you know, bringing this to, uh, to the larger world, this conversation. Thank you. And thank you for reading. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, I just, if you want to like give a shout out website or, you know, how, how they can get the book. Oh, I mean, uh, my website is uh, darahorn.com, D-A-R-A-H-O-R-N.com. But, uh, the book is People Love Dead Jews. And uh, there's also a podcast, uh, which is Adventures with Dead Jews, which is uh, 
stories that don't appear in the book because you know this topic is bottomless. Right, unfortunately, this topic is bottomless. Okay, well, we uh, we wish you uh, continued success and continued uh, inspiring. Thank you. Okay, all the best, and thank you so much for listening. You can catch us same time, same place next week. Bye bye.